Let's bow our heads for prayer. Thank you, Jesus. We are honored to be in your presence this beautiful morning. Thank you for taking care of us the entire week, walking with us, guiding us, being with us at our places of work and influence for your divine protection as we travel on the road, for your favor as we sat in meetings and did business. We stand in awe of you and lift to you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we pray, Lord, this morning that as you're gathered in this place that is called by your name, that, Lord, you will inhabit our praises. The scriptures remind us that when two or three are gathered in your name, you promise to be there in their midst, to love on them and to minister to them. So, Father, we ask and pray that as we sit, that you'll speak to us. You will minister to us. You will encourage us. You will rebuke. You will correct. You will teach so that the men and the women of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord, I pray as I hide behind the backdrop of the cross that it will please you and please heaven to use me as a vessel of honor. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. It's a um, blessing to be here this morning. And we thank God for giving us an opportunity to be in his house and to just experience him, sit at his feet like Mary, and learn from his word. I want to believe that you've had a prayerful week as you've been engaged and connected with God at the place of prayer. And I love Jeremiah 33, verses 3, that reminds us that call unto me, and I will show you great and mighty things that you know not about. So I want to believe that the Holy Spirit will continually reveal to you things that you have not seen or heard because you are connecting with God at the place of prayer. Last Sunday, we shared on the what, how, and why of prayer. We drew our lessons from Matthew 6, 5 to 15. We pointed out that prayer is having conversation with God. It is both uh, talking and listening to him. And we drew the how of prayer by looking at the six petitions that are contained in what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. We pointed out that the six petitions are clustered in two main uh, groups. The first three are petitions relating to the nature of God, beginning with us having a right relationship with God, our Father who art in heaven. He also pointed out that there is need of us when you go to pray that we reverence God, we honor him. Her Lord be your name. And that's a beautiful thing to do when you get to the place of prayer. We pointed out also that under that first cluster of petitions relating to the nature of God, that we also resign before God. And prayer is doing that, resigning before the Lord, committing your concerns and your cares to him and leaving them at the foot of the cross. The second cluster of petitions, we pointed out um, the first one under these relating petitions relating to the needs of man. The first one is a request for provision. Give us this day our daily bread. And our God is so faithful that when we pray, when we go to him and ask for bread, ask him to intervene at our places of work, in that business, in that matter at home, that he will do it because he is God and he's promised to do that. A request for provision. And pointed out also the second petition under that cluster is a request for pardon, forgive us 
our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. He pointed out that in prayer we acknowledge that we we need the mercy and the grace of God, and also say that if you are not willing to forgive those who have wronged us, those who have hurt us, those who have offended us, then when we go to God and ask him for mercy, that there is a high possibility that you will not receive mercy and grace from him. But when we surrender to him and ask God for grace and strength to release those who have hurt us and have a forgiven spirit, then we receive mercy and grace from the throne of God. We signed off by pointing out that the third petition under that cluster is a request for protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we pointed out and say that prayer acknowledges our need for God's protection. We signed off by looking at the why of prayer and said that nothing happens until someone prays. In your family, at your place of work, things won't change until you pick up the discipline of prayer. Whether it is two minutes, five minutes a day, 15 minutes, but just engaging and connecting with God. It makes heaven to begin doing some amazing transactions in our lives. And so say that we pray because it is a command which God has given us. Jesus told the disciples when we pray, meaning he expects us to pray and to engage God um, at that place of prayer, the prayer closet. Today we'll focus on fasting, on the ABC of fasting, the very basic lessons uh, and principles that we draw from the word of God. I'll primarily focus on the Old Testament text of Jonah 3 verses 1 and 10. You'll appreciate that the book of Jonah was written by Jonah, son of Amittai, uh, to the people of Israel. The purpose of him writing the book was to show the extent of God's grace, the message of salvation for all people, both the Israelites and the Ninevites. But you will notice that Jonah was reluctant uh, to take the message of salvation to the people of Nineveh. And the reason why Jonah was a little bit hesitant is because the Assyrians were an idolatrous and proud and ruthless nation. They were not in good terms with the Israelites. And so at the back of the mind of this prophet thought, it's unfair for me to go and minister the message of God to these people because after having done that, God is merciful, he will forgive them. So Jonah struggled with the fact that at some point, God will forgive the people of Nineveh. Chapter 1 deals with the fleeing prophet running away from the mission. Chapter 2 deals with the praying prophet having been thrown into the sea and swallowed. Jonah prays a beautiful prayer that we find in chapter 2. Chapter 3, our focus today deals with the fasting Ninevites. And chapter 4 focuses on the grumbling prophet. One of the things that you will notice from chapter 3, our focus today, is the power of fasting. That when the people of Nineveh had the message of God, they went into fasting. And it's good for us to know that these were not believers. They were not worshippers of Yahweh. They didn't have the message of God, but picked a principle that contained um, in the Bible, a principle of God and fasted. And I love as his stand says, God saw their humility and the way they humbled themselves and were broken before him. And he had mercy on them. Meaning that when we fast and ask God to be merciful and gracious to us, that he always responds. First thing you will notice is voluntary abstinence from food for a for the purpose of seeking a deeper relationship with God. 
that is that practice where we, we do either our food for a period of time for the sake of just getting to connect with God and having an intimate experience with him. The Israelites were required to fast at least once a year on the Day of Atonement when the priests went into the Holy of Holies and presented a sacrifice of repentance on behalf of the entire nation. On that day, they were required to fast. There is also reliable church um, history that points out that the early church had a practice of fasting every Wednesday and Friday each week. No wonder when you read church history, you appreciate the way God moved madly during the early church. Some of the amazing revivals that took place were as a result of the church fasting. A few come to my mind, the Azusa Street revival, that before the move of God in that place in America, that the church was in prayer and fasting, seeking the face of God. In 1906, in Wales, during the Welsh revival, a man by the name Evans Roberts uh, pleaded and prayed and told God to bend his knees and pray that the community will also come to know the Lord in such an intimate manner. And God released a revival that turned Wales around. Coming closer home during, in the 1950s, during the East Africa revival, Dr. Joe Church, a serving in Rwanda, then took retreat in Uganda and had time to pray and fast. And the result, what we know as the East Africa revival. When the church goes into fasting, go, God comes into action. He pours his Holy Spirit. He ministers to families, to nations, to people. The people of Nineveh fasted and God had mercy on them. As you read the Bible, you will see three types of fasting. They are named after the characters and the people that practice them. The first one that you see in the Bible is what we refer to as a normal fast or the Jesus fast. Before Jesus launched his ministry, before he ever laid his hand on a sick person, before he called the disciples, before he did a sermon, the Bible says in Matthew that Jesus went into the wilderness where he prayed and fasted for 40 days and, and 40 nights. Then in Matthew chapter 4, verses 2, he comes out and the Bible says that Jesus was hungry. It doesn't say he was thirsty. Bible scholars propose that there is a high possibility that Jesus was seeking water when he was fasting for these 40 days. So a normal fast of the Jesus fast is where you decide to do away with your food and you take water for whatever period of time that you feel led by the Holy Spirit to be fast, to fast, whether it's a day or two days or three days or seven days, but not more than 40 days. Jesus left a classical example for us to follow. He fasted for 40 days. And the results are amazing after Jesus comes from the wilderness and begins ministry, miracles begin to follow him. John Hagee says that Jesus was powerful, not because he's the second person of the Trinity, but because he was a man of prayer and fasting. And God honored his ministry with the many signs and wonders that we read in the gospel. So the first type of fasting, as you see in scripture, is the normal fast of the Jesus fast. The second one is what we call the dry fast or the Esther fast. This is why you don't take water or food. In Esther chapter 4, verse 16, I, I bet you know the story. Um, the people of God are in exile, and a law has been passed that they will be annihilated in the next couple of days. And Esther is already in the, in the, in the palace. And Mordecai, the uncle, sends a message uh, to Esther and tells her what will happen and calls her to pray. And Esther sends a word and tells Mordecai, go and fast. And I will also do the same. For three days and three nights, we will not take food or drink any water. 
And then he signs off that message by saying, then afterwards I will go to the king. If I perish, I perish. The reason why Esther adds that statement is because at that particular time and season, the queen was not supposed to go before the king. The only time that he go before the king was upon the king inviting the queen to come into his court. And you know what happened afterwards? God performed a miracle. The Israelites were saved. Haman was hanged. Mordecai was promoted. The Esther fast. And the last that you see in the Bible is what you refer to as the partial fast or the Daniel fast. This is why you restrict your diet and do away with a few, uh, some pleasant uh, meals, maybe meat and, and animal products. That is ideally what the church has done for many years during this season of Lent. In Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 and 3, Daniel resolved in his heart uh, to, and set his mind to pray and seek the face of God to fast for three weeks, for 21 days. And the Bible says in verse 7 of that same chapter that the angel goes to him and tells him, the first time you set your mind to pray in and to seek in God, you are, God heard your prayer and your answer was sent. At that very time, not after the 21 days, but when he decided to seek the face of God. So three types of fast that you see in the Bible, Jesus, first Esther, and Daniel. Why is it important for us to pick up the discipline of fasting? Allow me to point out that God is not inviting us to fast because we don't have something to eat. He's inviting us to fast because he desires that we may have an intimate and a close and, and a vibrant and dynamic relationship with him. We fast, it's important for us to fast because when we fast, we humble ourselves and repent. In Joel 2, the prophet writes and, and calls and tells the people of, of Judah to consecrate a fast so as to humble themselves before the Lord. God invites us to fast so that we may humble and repent like the Ninevites who repented and, and, and fasted. Also, when we fast, miracles happen. And for me, the classical one is that one of Esther, that when he goes and appears before the king, the Bible says uh, the king asked Esther what her request was and promised that he was ready to give Esther up to half his kingdom. What happened? God changed things when Esther and Mordecai were fasting. Transactions took place in heaven in the spiritual world. And the king was more than willing to give Esther the things that she desired. Miracles happen when we pray and fast. When we fast also, we receive God's mercy and grace. We receive the remission of sin. The Ninevites, a classical example, they humbled, they fasted, they repented, and God had mercy on them. At times in our Christian walk, we have what you refer to as habitual sin, the sin that so easily entangled, something that is stubborn in your life. You go to God today, you talk about it with him, you repent, and then you live liberated and free, but after a couple of days, you're back to it. God will have us in such kind of environment and with such kind of challenges that will take up the discipline of fasting for our sins to be forgiven and for the chains of sin to be broken. When we fast, God's work is established. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts chapter 13, which is really the story of um, the beginning of the church and the growth of the Christian ministry, the church in Antioch, the Bible says in verses 1 to 3, were in prayer and fasting. Then the Holy Spirit said to the church, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work of the ministry that I've called them into. When the church fasts and in prayer, the Holy Spirit gets an environment and we create an atmosphere when 
where the Holy Spirit can speak and talk to us. As we think about CTC, such a brilliant vision that God has given to us. God will have us pray and fast as much as we are given for this project that will be used to reach out to young people and bring them to, to the knowledge of Christ and posterities will be told of our God. God will also have us pray and fast for his work to be established. We see also in Joel chapter 2 that when we pray and fast, the Holy Spirit falls afresh on us. The prophet reminding the people of God to, to just get to fast for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In the gospel in Mark chapter 9, there is an interesting story there from verses 29. There is a, a gentleman who takes his son to Jesus. The son happened to have been demon-possessed. Jesus is not um, in the vicinity, but he gets the disciples and requests the disciples of Jesus Christ to pray for the son uh, for his deliverance. The disciples pray and they do everything that's required to, for a deliverance, but nothing happens. Then later Jesus shows up and Jesus looks at the boy and commands the demon to live and immediately the demon lives. And the disciples were surprised because later when they are doing debrief in the evening, they ask him, why is it that you aren't able to kill that boy? Jesus says, in verses 29, this kind can only live by prayer and fasting. Friends, there is a, a kind in life. There is a kind in business, in family, that only comes out through prayer and fasting. There is a level in which if you don't fast, you will not get with God. And invites all of us, invites all of us, not only to pray, but also to fast. And in the gospel text, verses 16, Jesus uses the same statement that he used regarding prayer and says, when you fast, expecting us. Fast. I encourage us, brothers and sisters in Christ, to purpose during this Lent season that you will create time for prayer and fasting. Whether it's a day or two, once a week, only one day in the entire 40 day journey. Purpose to pray and fast as a family, as a church, as an organization where you head, and you will begin to see amazing things in your life and at your place of work. As I come to the close, a few weeks ago, I was privileged to attend a leadership conference, and one of the speakers left an impression on my heart and spirit. That's Kevin Mulay. He's, um, he's the guy in charge of Mo Sound, an entertainment uh, company in Kenya. They say that they have a tradition at, in their organization, but they fast every Thursday. Most of is not a church, by the way. It's not a Christian organization. It's only led by a Christian. But they fast every Thursday. He was saying as a result of that, God has opened opportunities for them in East and Central Africa that no big event happens here without them receiving a call and being invited to come on board. That tells you the power of fasting. I invite us, brothers and sisters, that the Lord will inspire us by his Holy Spirit and will come to the point where we not only pray, but also fast. Let us pray. We thank you for the ministry of your word this morning, for reminding us Lord, not only to pray, but also to fast. We ask you, Holy Spirit of God, this morning, 
that these words that you've heard and shared will fall on the good soil of our hearts and bear fruit to the honor and glory of your holy name. And most importantly, we'll be like Jesus and create time where we fast. Bless these, your servants, and minister to them. And Lord, as they purpose and plan to fast, may we show up and show off on their behalf and behalf of their families. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.